Hi all. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. I also want to thank those of you who donate to the Patreon account. There will be more rewards coming down the pipe, such as giveaways. From now on, every week, a winner will be drawn from the Patreon pool and will receive a psychic reading from me online. I am a card reader and astrologer, and I will do a reading for you online, should your name be chosen. Once again, the Patreon link is www.patreon.com slash leader1 www.patreon.com slash l-e-a-d-e-r-o-n-e Thank you and enjoy the show. Castro. Ariel Castro was born on July 10, 1960, in Douay, Puerto Rico. Douay is located on the outskirts of Yauco, the coffee capital of Puerto Rico. His family owned most of the land on an isolated mountainous barrio of a district known as La Para. Though his family enjoyed high social status in the community, they were not wealthy. They lived in a Spartan wooden shack at the top of the mountain. There was no running water, no electricity. They did all their cooking over coal fires on the dirt floor. The patriarch, Pedro, drove to a well each day to fill plastic buckets with water so they could do their cooking and bathing. After Pedro's affair and hidden family with another woman came to light, Pedro left Ariel's mother Lillian and their children behind. This left Lillian and the children in dire straits. Lillian relocated to Redding, Pennsylvania. She moved in with her father, Americano Rodriguez. She left her children behind in Puerto Rico. They were raised by their grandmother, Hercelia Carabello. Lillian's visits were few and far between. Hercelia approached parenting with a laissez-faire policy, providing very little in the way of parental supervision. Ariel has claimed that he was sexually abused at the age of five. The alleged perpetrator was a nine-year-old family friend. Years later, he was asked by a psychiatrist why he did not report the incident. He said, people who are abused keep quiet, so I did. He also noted that he started masturbating as a child, which led to a lifelong fixation on sex. This is not unheard of among child victims of sexual abuse. In 1966, Lillian Rodriguez was in the mood for motherhood again. She brought her children to Reading to live with her. According to Ariel, his mother was very abusive. She was violent, hitting him with belts, sticks, and an open hand. She was also verbally abusive. As Ariel put it, she was always, quote, yelling negative things and cursing at us. Though he wouldn't have dared say it to her at the time, he told his psychiatrist years later that, quote, I would ask God for her to die. The only positive parental influence in his life at that point was his uncle Julio Castro, who gave Ariel a guitar for Christmas one year. Ariel demonstrated a natural aptitude for music. He was also talented at sports. His academic performance was below average. He also had a disciplinary record in school. During his time in junior high, he was suspended for touching a girl's breast. He also got into many fights with his alumni. In high school, he joined a band playing bass. He drank alcohol and smoked marijuana on a regular basis. One high school friend, Daniel Marti, 
recalled his memory of a secondary school model, Ariel Castro. He was popular, outgoing, and smart. He played the bass real good and had girlfriends. Everybody knew him. Daniel's brother, Javier, said, The guy was just a regular Joe. He's got a great family and always had nice cars and bikes. Ariel was financially well endowed because he and his mother moved to Cleveland, where his father had finally settled. His father set up a business with his brothers, and they became prominent members of the local Puerto Rican community. Ariel graduated high school on June 30, 1979. He finished at the end of his class, with a C average and a grade point average of 2.15. His father clearly didn't plan on including Ariel in his business. Ariel worked in a supermarket and supplemented his income playing gigs with his band. He was still living at home, so he had the disposable income to spend on his passions, like expensive clothing, sports cars, motorcycles, and musical instruments. He soon began to date a girl named Nilda Figueroa. They would remain together for 14 years. She would bear most of his children. Nilda's sister, Elida Carabello, recalled their dynamic. He was a nice guy. He was real good to my sister at the beginning. Their son, Ariel Anthony Castro Jr., was born on September 27, 1981. Ariel was over the moon. He even had Nilda bring the baby to his gigs so he could show him off. Alida said that Ariel began to treat Nilda differently after Junior was born. To quote Alida, he just started being too controlling, too possessive, and he would abuse her. I think having the child made him feel she was his property. Nilda testified at Ariel's trial and spoke about the abuse, an excerpt. It was over a small argument. He just punched me in the face and grabbed me by the head and threw me back against the concrete floor. The second time, he punched me so hard that he broke my nose. Nilda was too frightened to tell anyone about the abuse at the time. She wore heavy makeup and head scarves to conceal the bruises. Ariel also laid out a list of rules he forced her to obey under penalty of harsh physical violence. His permission was required if she were to leave the apartment. He instituted a dress code for public outings. She was to wear long granny dresses so that other men would not be able to ogle her. She could only stop at a grocery store that received his approval. He was so determined to maintain this oppressive control that he would sometimes set up a ruse whereupon he would leave the apartment but remain downstairs. This way, he would catch her leaving the apartment without his consent should that occur. It seemed to him that these wasted hours of his life that he would never get back were a worthwhile investment to ensure that Nilda's liberty was curtailed to his satisfaction. Any violation of his edicts elicited a merciless beating. To quote Elida, he isolated her. She never had any friends anymore and saw us less and less. Ariel even dictated which television programs Nilda was not allowed to watch. The Cosby Show, despite its family-friendly fare, was verboten because of its cast of African Americans. Ariel hated black people. Nilda was not to watch television when he was not home. When he came through the door, he would place his hand on the back of the TV to feel for warmth, the most obvious method to detect that it was in use within the hour. If this was the case, he would read the latest issue of TV Guide, and if the hours during his absence included programming Nilda was forbidden to watch, he would beat her. Nilda became pregnant for the second time in March 1982. The beatings got worse. Her status as domestic servant was consolidated, no matter how she felt. To quote Nilda, I was pregnant, and he wanted me to get up and do the dishes. If Nilda experienced morning sickness 
and put off cleaning chores to a later point in the day, Ariel would beat her. The beatings were getting worse, and the severity of the injuries was commensurate. As Nilda put it, he just punched me in the mouth and knocked two of my teeth out. I had told him I was too tired to get up. Ariel was hired by the Cosmo Plastics Factory. He moved with his family to an apartment in Nilda's father's house to save money. Such proximity to Nilda's father did not intimidate Ariel. He was as short-tempered and abusive as ever. To quote her father, Ismail, he regularly locked her in there, and I know he beat my daughter, who told us not to get involved. January 13, 1983. Ariel and Nilda's second child, a daughter named Angie, was born. Elita and her brother Frank paid a visit to see the baby. Ariel wouldn't allow it. To quote Frank, He was so strict. Angie was a little baby, and he wouldn't let us touch her. He didn't want anyone near his daughter. Following Angie's birth, Ariel's abuse of Nilda became more vicious than ever. During one particularly heated argument, he pushed Nilda into a large cardboard box and closed the flaps. Elita recalled what followed. He told her, You stay there until I tell you to get out. That's when I got scared and ran downstairs to get my parents. Months later, Ariel was fired from his job. His family depended on social assistance. He spent most of his time at home. Nelda couldn't watch whatever TV show she wanted, but Ariel took the liberty of using her food stamps to buy cocaine. Ariel Jr. typically kept his distance from his father, especially when he was in a rage. Outsiders were unaware of the abuse. His only friends were his brothers, Pedro and O'Neill. He still played music. He presented a facade at his gigs that belied the ornery temperament that kept his wife and children walking on eggshells. The members of his musical audience with whom he interacted often found him to be charming and charismatic. There was a subset of this contingent who noticed a few peculiarities, however. If a band wore uniforms, Ariel would refuse to wear it. He insisted on standing out. As Bill Perez, who owns Belinda's nightclub, put it, he could be demanding and cocky at times, and always wanted to be king of the group. 1985. Ariel was hired as a driver for Kumba Motors. He and his family moved to a new apartment. It was there where the domestic violence escalated to new heights of barbarity. During one argument between Ariel and Nilda, he punched her in the nose and broke it for the second time. He allowed her to have it set back into position at a hospital, but forbade her from reporting the incident to the authorities. A few weeks later, Nilda was back in hospital. This time, Ariel kicked her in the ribs numerous times when she made a comment he didn't care for. An x-ray revealed that one of Nilda's ribs was shattered. There were more injuries. He dislocated her shoulders when he twisted her arm behind her back and threw her around their bedroom like she was a rag doll. Nilda reflected on all the physical abuse to which Ariel subjected her. He felt that it was some kind of punishment that I needed. The punishment also consisted of hitting her over the head with a metallic bar, which landed her in hospital for three days. She incurred a serious concussion. The wound required over 40 stitches. As usual, he did not allow her to call the police before she was treated. To quote Nilda, That's the only way he would let me into the hospital, because he wanted me to die that day. He wanted me to bleed to death. The staff at Grace Hospital recognized the signs of abuse, but they could not contact the police without her consent, which was not given. Recalling their reaction to this, Nilda said, They weren't too happy about me going home. One permanent injury was visited upon her in 1987, when Ariel punched her in the eye so hard he left her partially blind. As Nilda put it, he came at me full force with his fist. He punched me in the eye. There's a lot of nerve damage. 
Being pregnant didn't instill any mercy in Ariel. In January 1988, while she was carrying his third child, he hit her on the head with a barbell. To quote Nilda, I was nine months pregnant. He hit me over the head with a hand weight. Beat me. Fortunately, the fetus was not harmed, and she gave birth to their daughter, Emily Lissette, a few days later. Over the next two years, the beatings were as firmly embedded in Nilda's life as ever. However, there was a bend in the road on September 30th, 1989. The police got involved. O'Neill came to their home and invited Ariel out for a drink. When Nilda asked him where they were going, he slapped her in the face several times. She tried to escape, but he grabbed her. He slammed her head against the wall over and over. This was the last straw. Nilda escaped from the apartment and ran upstairs to their neighbor's home. She asked them to call the police, and they obliged. Ariel was arrested. He was held in custody under suspicion of assault. An ambulance took Nilda and their children to St. John's Hospital. She received medical treatment and was interviewed by police. She was too scared to press charges, so the police were left with no choice but to release him. Ariel Jr. commented on what it was like growing up in this atmosphere. Life with my father growing up was abusive and painful. He was a violent, controlling man, and my mother was the one who bore the brunt of his attacks, although I wasn't spared either. I remember crying myself to sleep because my legs were covered in welts from belts and seeing my mother getting beat up in our home. No one should ever have to see their mom crumpled up in a corner on the floor the way I did so many times. 1990, Nilda became pregnant with their fourth child. She gave birth to their daughter Arlene on September 6th. They moved to another apartment. Just as this new phase of their lives had begun, Ariel was fired by Kumba Motors for indolence. He was hired in 1991 to drive a bus for the Cleveland Board of Education. April 29th, 1992. Ariel bought a house for his family to live in. His wife and children had lived in small, confined apartments for years and looked forward to the space a house has to offer. This house was no exception, but they would not enjoy the comparably palatial layout of this structure as they anticipated. Ariel installed padlocks all over the place. Most ominously, he converted the basement into a dungeon. There was a heavy trap door. He stacked up layers of curtains and bricks for soundproofing. Ariel Jr. recalled this. Growing up in Seymour Avenue, my father was always very secretive. He kept a lock on the attic and on the basement door. He nailed the windows shut. There were places we could never go. Indeed, Ariel had plans, and he could only execute them successfully by keeping them confidential. The violence got worse. After Nilda informed Ariel that she was pregnant once again, he flew into a senseless rage because he didn't want more children. He punched and kicked Nilda in the stomach as a means to abort the fetus. Elita recalled the conditions Nilda lived in at the time. All hell started breaking loose. I would go over to the house and be knocking at the door, and she was there, and he wasn't. I'd say, open the door, and she'd say, I can't. Ariel has the key. He locked her in. Ariel's grip of control squeezed even tighter on Nilda's life. She was no longer allowed to use the telephone. His ultimate goal in cutting her lines of communication to the outside world was to sever her ties to her friends and family. He spied on her frequently to find out if she violated this ordinance. Commenting on this, Elita said, he would go creeping downstairs, spying on her, see who she's calling. Next thing you know, he'll pop upstairs. Frank Carabello, Nilda's brother-in-law, was aware of the abuse, saying Castro pushed her down the stairs, broke her nose, fractured her ribs, and dislocated both shoulders. And these were only the injuries and incidents of which he was aware. One day, Frank had had enough. 
and he engaged in a physical altercation of his own with Ariel. To quote Carabello, I was hitting him too because I was tired of her being abused. His young son, Angel, was terrified of his uncle Ariel. He often went to the house to play with his cousins, and he was put off by some of the things he witnessed. Padlocks on every door. The basement door bolted shut. Whether he turned up with his parents or not, Ariel would make them wait outside for a half hour before he let them in. They were never allowed to go past the living room. Occasionally, Ariel's behavior transitioned from sinister to strange. Soon after moving into the house, Ariel bought a creepy, life-sized mannequin. It had slanted eyes, and it was clad in a long dress. He topped it off with a black wig. He would place it in the back seat of his sports car and drive around Cleveland, incurring discomfort in pedestrians, as often as he did with his family and guests. He also used it as a scarecrow of sorts, propping it up against a wall in the house as a warning, whose implications were never entirely clear. All hell could only say, he threatened me lots of times with it. He would say, act up again, you'll be in that back room with a mannequin. Once when Nilda returned from a grocery run, Castro leapt at her in the doorway, brandishing the mannequin. She was so startled she fell down the stairs, smashing her head open along the way. One day, Ariel and Nilda's eldest daughter, Angie, picked the lock on the basement door. She sneaked downstairs. As she put it, we went snooping, and I remember there being a fish tank down there, which is odd because there was nobody to look at the fish. She also saw the mannequin in the basement. It was set up as a two-seat swing, similar to the type that is installed on porches. Fortunately, Ariel never found out that Angie had been in the basement. Ariel joined a band called the Ocasio Latin Jazz Project. Sometimes they played gigs out of town, taking Ariel out of the house overnight. Though his family was relieved of the threat of violence that constantly hung over them, they were less than thrilled to be locked in their house. A private investigator named Chris Giannini interviewed Nilda, his report. He had the windows tinted so you couldn't see inside and the doors were padlocked. He would go out to play music, and even her sister couldn't see her. On another occasion, Ariel pushed Nilda down a flight of stone steps, resulting in a fracture to her skull. This time, she was left with permanent brain damage. Elita recalled this incident. He broke her skull from the front of her head to the back of her head. Even after her injuries to her head, he would still be mean to her. Domestic violence was routine in Ariel Jr.'s life growing up. He witnessed the beatings and humiliation on a daily basis. He dreaded the arrival of Ariel's car in the driveway. It was a gateway to another evening of intervening on his mother's behalf and his father's brutal retaliations. One time, Ariel dragged him down into his basement dungeon and punished him there. He whipped him with a dog chain. Afterwards, Ariel inculcated into Junior how fortunate he was to have a man like Ariel for a father, since he had not abandoned him like his own father had. At that point in the family's history, paternal abandonment would have been a merciful act. Junior reflected on this in July 2013. I grew up in a house with a lot of fear and a lot of violence. My father was incredibly strict. He had a temper. He wasn't a monster 24-7, but if you crossed him, there would be consequences. Physical consequences. Curiously, Ariel Sr. never beat his daughters. To quote Junior, He treated my sisters like daddy's girls. There was no abuse directed towards them. As a boy, I sometimes resented it when I saw how they were treated differently than I was. Angie concurred, saying that she and her sisters were never beaten. They were traumatized by the specter of spousal abuse that befell Nilda, however. As Angie recalled, when mom and dad were fighting, I just wanted to melt into the ground. I've seen him basically stomp on her like she was a man. Sometimes Nilda was driven to knock on her neighbor's doors, seeking protection from Ariel. Most of them turned a blind eye. 
They were as intimidated by Ariel as she was, and they didn't want to risk becoming the next victims. One neighbor, Jovita Marti, remembers Nilda's appeals for sanctuary. When he used to hit her, she used to come over here and ask for help. She wanted us to call the police, but my father didn't want to get involved with the police because Castro will get mad at him. So we helped her and let her stay in the house until Castro calmed down and she could go home again. The brain damage Ariel inflicted on Nilda when he threw her down the stone stairs was not only irreversible, but complications began to emerge. She had seizures on a regular basis. She was admitted to the Cleveland Clinic to undergo brain surgery. The surgeons discovered a blood clot that solidified into a tumor. The surgeon asked her after the operation what caused the injury. Nelda was at the end of her rope. She could not lie or protect Ariel anymore. Due to his actions, she had an inoperable tumor that was predicted to bring about her demise. She told the surgeon that Ariel threw her down stone stairs. Ariel was not brought to justice at this time. Less than a month later, Ariel came home drunk and immediately launched an attack on Nilda. He threw her to the floor. He kicked her in the head and along her body. Ariel Jr. ran out the front door in a panic. He took to the streets, desperate to find somebody who would help his mother. Ariel Sr. chased him down the street. As he did, Nilda locked the front door and called the police. Ariel disappeared by the time a squad car arrived at the house. The officers searched for him, but he could not be located. A dispatcher called them back to the house minutes later because Ariel was in a rage as he tried to break in. When the cruiser arrived, they found Ariel pounding on the front door and screaming at Nilda to let him in. When Ariel saw the police, he ran. This time Nilda pressed charges. She signed a misdemeanor complaint against Ariel Castro. That is, until the following morning, when she changed her mind. She told detectives that she wanted all the domestic violence charges against Ariel dropped. Castro's case was ordered to be presented for a grand jury. He was freed on $25,000 bail. February 1994, a grand jury declined to charge Ariel Castro with domestic violence. Nelda Figueroa denied that he beat her. She insisted she was at fault. Ariel was discharged with a clean record. Nelda admitted 11 years later that Ariel met her in front of the courthouse before she was due to testify. He offered her money and a new car and vowed to treat her better if she agreed not to testify against him. She initially refused his offer. Ariel threatened to murder her and their children. As Nelda recalls, he said, Look, bitch, if you do, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to take care of the kids. I mean, kill the kids too. So I was scared. Out of fear for the lives of herself and her children, she felt she was left with no choice but to lie to the court and say the beating never happened. Days later, Ariel Castro moved out of their house and in with his mother, Lillian, and his two brothers. He still showed up at Nilda's house and demanded to see his children. Elita recounted these visits. He would show up uninvited, although he was not living with me on Seymour Avenue. He attacked me again late one night after I had surgery. While I was down on the ground, he kicked me in the head. His son, Ariel, witnessed the attack and ran from the house to get help. Nilda left her house for the last time. She took the children with her. They moved into her grandmother's house. Ariel moved back into the house on Seymour and customized it in keeping with what one might expect to see in a concentration camp. He fortified it with chain-link fences, mortise locks, and deadbolts. Whatever he had in store for this house, it appeared that he was determined that nobody else would enter or leave. Nilda was having seizures. She signed up for another operation. Despite some trepidation, 
She asked Ariel if he would look after their children during her convalescence. He refused her request. The way he saw it, they were not his problem anymore. Nilda commented on this. He said he didn't have any more room in his house. I mean, it has five bedrooms and two bathrooms. Nilda underwent a program of neurologic physical therapy after her surgery. One day, a security guard by the name of Fernando Colon saw that she was in a daze. She had just received another beating by Ariel. Eventually, the two struck up a friendship. She confided in him, intimating that she was a victim of domestic violence. Castro knew she lived with her mother and knew where her mother lived, so Fernando offered to let her and her children move in with him. By then, they had become lovers. Soon after she moved in, they became engaged. Ariel learned about this when his daughter Emily called him from Fernando's landline. Ariel was apoplectic. Fernando recalled what happened next. So he got my number, and that night he just kept calling and calling and calling. And I let Nilda talk to him. I said, look, tell him that you're done with him and to leave you alone. And if he doesn't, we'll press charges against him. And this time they're going to go through. Ariel launched into a volley of verbal abuse against Nilda. Fernando grabbed the phone. As Fernando tells it, I told him, you need to leave her alone. He said that she was his wife. But I said, no, she's not your wife because you did not marry her. She doesn't want to be with you anymore. Don't call my phone again. Ariel Castro vowed that he would exact revenge against Fernando Colon. He started by making every effort to turn his son against him. As Ariel Jr. put it, he constantly tried to undermine him. He told me, yeah, he's going to get his. Ariel spent time with his father at Ariel's house. He recounted this one story. My father took me to school the next morning. We stopped near Fernando's house at a stop sign. And he looked over at the house and he said to me, You know what your mom's doing in there? And I kind of looked over. He said, She's hoeing in there. He asked me if I knew what that meant. And I said, Yeah. Nilda and the children became happier and more self-confident while living with Fernando. The children accepted him as a stepfather. They experienced domestic stability and tranquility, the likes of which had been theretofore exotic to them. To quote Fernando, Nilda and those kids were psychologically injured. He just had them all messed up with his threats. They'd seen him beat his mother, and he had the environment under his control for so long Nobody could do or say anything. Ariel didn't disappear from their lives entirely. He found out where Fernando lived and would show up unannounced any time of the day or night. He would demand that they release the children into his custody. Fernando was having none of it and told Castro to leave. Castro would argue with him and issue threats. As Fernando recalled, I told him to his face, You're an abusive man. I don't know what you're going to do to these kids. In conclusion, he told Ariel to move on with his life and cease all contact with Nilda and the children. Ariel's response, One day I'm going to get you back. I'm going to destroy your life. May 16th, 1996. Fernando Colon filed a criminal complaint against Ariel Castro. Castro attempted to run him over with his car. Fernando was waiting in his car with the children at the time their school bus was due to arrive. This is an excerpt from the police report. The children's father pulled up behind him. He walked up to the victim's auto and was very profane. He told the victim that he'd better watch himself. Fernando tried to reason with Ariel, but to no avail. Castro got in his car and drove straight at Fernando. More from the police report. Victim states that Ariel Castro would have run him over if he did not get out of his way. This is an ongoing problem. The case was referred to a prosecutor, but once again no further action was pursued. In a rare act of mercy, Ariel backed off and reduced his contact with the children to about three times a year. January 22, 1996 
1997. A judge awarded Nelda full custody of their four children. Their father's visitation rights were terminated in toto. Nelda recalled what the judge said about the situation. She told me it was not a good idea for Mr. Castro to be around my children because of his abusive nature. Ariel did not attend the hearing. She informed him soon after that she wanted her children to use her surname, and he hit the roof. He refused his consent. In summer of 1999, Ariel Castro Jr. graduated from high school with honors and was accepted into the journalism program of Bowling Green State University. Before departing for the campus, he bid his father adieu while also proudly presenting his diploma. His father's reaction, who cares about that? You don't do anything around here. In May 2000, Ariel Castro was set up on a blind date by one of his colleagues in the music circuit. Her name was Lillian Roldan. He was love at first sight. Like with every woman he courted, he was nothing but a gentleman, kind, charming, and solicitous. She later noted that he did little housework at his home, letting it run to squalor. He was so filthy, she suggested they sleep at her place. She was introduced to his three daughters, who were observing a strict dress code. He did not allow them to wear hot pants or any other kind of tightly form-fitting clothing. Lillian asked him why there was a padlock on the door to the basement. He told her he kept all of his money in the basement, and he was concerned his children would steal it. At one point, Ariel asked her to marry him. She did not want to marry, and when he asked her to move in, she declined that offer too. He eventually charmed her into the idea. She heard about the abuse to which he subjected Nelda Figueroa, but it didn't seem plausible to her, considering his conduct during their courtship. To quote Lillian, I couldn't believe it because I never saw that side of Ariel. I mean, he was such a mellow person, so I thought she's probably making it up. During his time alone in the house, Ariel's sexual proclivities underwent a transformation. His carnal pathology took a turn toward the sadistic and the abusive. He developed a strong appetite for BDSM and humiliation. He amassed a large collection of BDSM-themed pornographic videos, which he kept in the basement. He kept this from everybody, including his new intimate partner Lillian. Their relationship couldn't have possibly been more unlike the one he shared with Nilda. She shared a given name with his mother, and he venerated her accordingly. If only Nilda had been so fortunate. Part 2. Michelle Knight Michelle Knight was born on April 23, 1981. Her father's identity is unknown. She and her family lived in poverty and dwelled in a high-crime area in Cleveland. Her mother, Barbara, scraped by on social assistance. As Michelle put it, My mom made sure I was dumber than a doormat just to get the SSI money. At the age of five, Michelle was molested by a friend of the family. They threatened to harm her if she reported the incident. The abuse resumed soon after and continued throughout her childhood. It remained unreported. Michelle didn't fare well at school either. Her attendance history was checkered, and she was designated as slow. Indeed, she struggled to make the same progress as her classmates. They would bully her, calling her ugly retard and dopey. Commenting on her scholastic experience, Michelle said, By the time I was 12 and going on 13, I had barely made it through the fifth grade. I was always the oldest kid in the class and it stunk. She did demonstrate an uncommon aptitude for illustration, however. November 1994, Michelle was 13 years old. She ran away from home to escape the sexual abuse. She slept on park benches and under a highway underpass, where she slept in a garbage can to stay warm. Over the next few months, she received alms from churches to survive. Eventually, she was recruited by a drug gang. They put her up in an apartment and paid her $300 a week to transport narcotics. This situation only lasted two weeks. 
The gang leader was arrested, and Michelle fell to the streets once again. At one point, a family friend spotted her on the street. He alerted her father, who drove her to her mother's home. At the age of 17, Michelle was impregnated while she was gang raped by three boys in a storage room at her school. Her mother wanted her to abort it, but Michelle decided to have the child. He was born in 1999, and she supported him and herself with social security checks. She dreamed of finding a job and moving out on her own, but her options were limited. Barbara invited her latest boyfriend to move in with him. He had a history of violence and alcoholism. One afternoon, Michelle came home to find the man lying in bed with her son Joey, then two years old, lying beside him. Her mother was supposed to be minding Joey, but she went out. Her boyfriend lunged at Michelle and made some inappropriate suggestions to her. This frightened Joey so much he wet himself. The man was drunk. He grabbed Joey's leg with so much force he fractured his knee. As Michelle said years later, my mother's boyfriend was high and drunk and he decided to take out his frustrations on my son. He twisted my son's leg, and I hear it crack. My son didn't scream. He didn't cry. He just looked at me and said, Mommy, help me. Michelle took Joey to a trauma center. When staff asked her how Joey's knee was broken, she told them he fell while playing in a park. While Joey was undergoing treatment, Barbara's boyfriend's sister called the hospital and told them what really happened to Joey. The police were notified, and the boyfriend confessed. He pleaded guilty to charges of child endangerment and felonious assault. Joey was placed in foster care. Social workers investigated the Knight's home to ensure that it had become a safer environment in which to raise a child. This was a trying time, as Michelle put it. Then they tried to say that I never protected him. I did all I could do. Michelle moved out of her mother's house and rented a room at her cousin Lisa's house. She was determined to find a job and regain custody of Joey. She was deeply depressed with Joey gone. Lisa introduced her to some of her friends that lived in the neighborhood, feeling that establishing a social life might lift her spirits. Before long, she met 14-year-old Emily Castro, daughter of Ariel Castro. Throughout July, Michelle and Emily became more closely acquainted and developed a friendship. One day, Emily showed Michelle a photo of Ariel on her cell phone. She referred to him as A.C. He would adopt a, quote, silly hillbilly accent for Emily's amusement when they spoke on the phone. Emily once put him on speaker as he did this so Michelle could hear it for herself. Michelle commented on her initial feelings regarding Ariel Castro. Emily never actually introduced me, yet I felt like I kind of knew him. He seemed like a pretty nice guy. August 22nd. Michelle Knight had an appointment with Cleveland Social Services to discuss Joey. She had never been to this office before and got lost along the way. Ariel Castro was driving along when he spotted Michelle Knight. He pulled over and followed her into a store. He overheard her asking a member of the staff where she could find the social service office. Ariel walked up just then with a smile on his face. As Michelle recalls, he was right beside me. He was like, well, I know where that's at. She recognized him as A.C. She said, I think I know you. Your daughter's name's Emily, right? Ariel said, This is a small world. He offered to drive her to the social services office, informing her that his car was right outside the store. Michelle accepted without trepidation. On the way out of the store, she regaled him with a story of how she was fighting to reclaim custody of Joey. When Michelle got in his car, she noticed something curious. There were no handles inside on the doors. After departing, Ariel told her he had to swing by his house to check on some puppies he was selling. 
He told her his house was located on the route that led to the social services offices. At the house, Michelle told Ariel she would wait in the car as he walked through the front gate and to the back door of the house. When he returned, he invited her to enter the house and choose a puppy for Joey from among a litter he was selling. Michelle took him up on this offer, and he led her to the back door. As they walked upstairs, she noticed an eerie silence. She wasn't expecting the house to be so still not with puppies on the premises. She spotted a photograph of Emily on a wall. Ariel told her she was downstairs in another room and that she could visit with her soon. Once upstairs, Ariel brought her to a pink bedroom. Once she entered, he slammed the door and locked it from the outside. Michelle panicked and began to scream. She begged him to let her out, so she wouldn't miss her appointment with the social workers. Ariel entered the room. He put his hand over her nose and mouth. He placed the other on the back of her skull. He removed her glasses. They fell to the floor. He said to her, I'll kill you if you scream again. He threw her to the floor. She passed out. A few minutes later, Michelle re-emerged into consciousness. Ariel was looking down at her. There was a menacing look in his eyes. He told her not to move. He grabbed her purse and threw it against the wall. He went to the next bedroom to search for something. Michelle took a look around the room. A large metallic pole was set up on both sides of the room. A cable was attached to both poles and was tightly stretched between them several feet from the floor. When Castro returned, he was carrying a stool and two orange electrical extension cords. Michelle tried to stand. Ariel shouted, Lie still! He then reassured her that she would be okay and that he would not hurt her as long as she obeyed him. He told her he would free her soon. Ariel took a seat on a stool. He grabbed Michelle's legs. She tried kicking him off. He bound one of the cords around her ankles so tightly he cut off the circulation and they became numb. She tried to punch him off, but he grabbed her wrists and pulled her arms behind her back. He bound them together. He wound the other end of the cord around her neck and tied it tight. He pulled his pants down. He grabbed his penis and stood over her as he masturbated. As his arousal escalated, he suddenly became emotional. He told Michelle that he sincerely wanted to strike up a friendship with her. He said he had been lonely since his wife and kids deserted him. He said to Michelle, All I want is for someone to be here for me. I need you. Immediately after this statement, he climaxed. Having ejaculated, Castro pulled up his pants. He demanded that Michelle remain still. Michelle screamed and prayed. She was convinced he was going to kill her. He punched her as hard as he could on the side of her head. He followed up by telling her nobody could hear her scream. To establish more leverage, he pulled out a gun and threatened to shoot her. Castro rolled her over onto her stomach. He tied the second orange extension cord around her hands, feet, and neck. He connected her body to the cable. He hoisted her up far enough that her feet were a foot above the floor. As Michelle described it, I was tied up like a fish, an ornament on the wall. Castro capped it all off by stuffing an unlaundered and filthy gray sock in her mouth. He wrapped duct tape around her head. He told her he was going to get something to eat. He turned on the radio, left the room, and slammed the door behind him. Barbara reported Michelle's disappearance to the police. She noted that she was disabled, an excerpt from the police report. Reporting person states that missing person adult has a mental condition and that she is confused of her surroundings. 
a lot. Investigators checked hospitals, a relative's house, and the morgue. Michelle gagged with the befouled sock in her mouth. She soiled herself numerous times. She was starving and parched. When Castro returned to her room, he gave her an egg McMuffin. He ripped the duct tape from her face and removed the sock. He pushed the sandwich into her mouth. She screamed and fought back. He grabbed her jaw and held her mouth open with force. He commanded her to eat. She refused. He threw the sandwich on the floor. Castor untied the extension cord that attached her to the poles. She fell to the floor. Her limbs were benumbed. She screamed and tried to sit up. He called her a slut and ordered her to remain still. He held her down. He untied the cord that bound her wrists and ankles. He ordered her to get up, but she wept. She said she was unable to stand because of the pain in her legs. He picked her up and put her over his shoulders. He carried her to an adjacent bedroom. He threw her down on a mattress that was dirty and stained. He tore all her clothes off. He raped her for an hour as she screamed from the pain. She tried to fight him off, but she was no match for him. Once Castro was satisfied, he lay beside Michelle on the mattress. The mattress was now speckled in Michelle's blood. She promised him she wouldn't tell anyone what happened if he let her go. Bizarrely, Ariel started relating to Michelle as if she were his girlfriend. He told her about being molested in Puerto Rico and how much it hurt when Nilda left with the children. He said to her, I didn't mean to beat her, but it's like I ain't got the power to stop myself. After this, he got up and dressed himself. He pulled out some cash and threw it at Michelle. He told her it was payment for her services. Ariel told Michelle to put her clothes back on. Her shorts were stained with blood and urine. He dragged her down the stairs to the first floor. Her head hit each stair along the way. He unlocked a heavy wooden door and opened it. It was the door that led to the basement. He dragged her down to the basement. He threw her onto a pile of soiled clothing, the only comfort to be found on the concrete floor. A large white pole was situated in the middle of the basement, extending from the floor to the ceiling. Ariel turned on a light. There were dirty clothes everywhere. The washing machine in the basement had not seen much usage in a long time. Michelle took in the sight of hundreds of pornographic videos, which were stacked up against a wall. The one window was tinted with dirt and grime. Very lengths of heavy rusted chains lay on the floor. Ariel said to Michelle, This is where you are going to stay until I can trust you. He picked up two chains. She began to cry. He told her to stop. He picked up a dirty sock from the floor and stuffed it into her mouth. He dragged her over to the pole. He pulled her arms behind her back and bound her wrists with plastic restraints. He wrapped a rusty chain around her waist and attached her to the pole. He wound a similar chain around her head and neck. He put some of the chain in her mouth because he wanted her to taste the flavor of rusted metal. He padlocked both the chains together. He placed a motorcycle helmet on Michelle's head so that her screams would be muffled and inaudible to neighbors. This was more than Michelle could bear, and she passed out. Ariel Castro broke his life down into a routine he followed like clockwork. After dropping the students off at school, he would drive home, feed Michelle a few stale McDonald's hamburgers, and rape her. He would leave her chained up as he went about the business of driving the children home. When he came home from work, Michelle would hear him puttering around upstairs. He watched pornographic videos with a volume loud enough that she could hear. He smoked marijuana. 
She dreaded the sound of the key turning the lock in the basement door, because the only reason he ever went to the basement by this juncture was to rape Michelle. After finishing with her, he would throw napkins at her so she could clean herself off with them. Since she was bound, she wasn't able to accomplish this task, so he would ram them down her throat. Such were the conditions of Michelle Knight's descent into hell. Ariel Castro hadn't been so happy in many years. He was still gigging as a musician. His relationship with Lillian Roldan continued to satisfy him. Having a slave in his basement to rape and torture was the fulfillment of a long-term dream. Meanwhile, Michelle Knight woke each day to a nightmare. During the first few weeks of Michelle's captivity, he kept her chained to the pole with the motorcycle helmet on her head. He was raping her to a rate of up to seven times a day. If she complained, he would beat her. Recalling this routine, Michelle said years later, There's not a day that went by that I didn't get messed with or hurt in any type of way. He brought down a plastic bucket in which she could relieve herself. It was placed close enough to the pole for her to reach. Most days she was allowed one meal, which was typically a McDonald's hamburger and a glass of orange juice. Due to the restricted airflow of the helmet, Michelle passed in and out of consciousness frequently throughout every day. She would cope by thinking about Joey. Sometimes she wanted to die, but she would think of Joey and the possibility of a reunion, and that would endow her with the strength to hold on. A month after he abducted her, Ariel brought Michelle out of the basement and back upstairs to one of the bedrooms. He chained her up naked to a bed. Any view of the outside world previously seen out the windows was blocked by sheets of gray wool with barbed wire strung across them. She knew it was morning when she smelled Castro frying bacon for his breakfast, but other than that she had no sense of time. In September, Michelle became pregnant with Ariel's baby. Having recognized the symptoms from her previous pregnancy, she knew there was no other explanation. She was too frightened to tell Castro. She had no idea how he might react. The jig was up when he noticed her nipples were leaking. He asked her if she was pregnant. Michelle said she thought she was. Ariel pounded her in the stomach with a barbell so hard she fell to the floor. Over the next several weeks, the tortures to which Ariel subjected Michelle escalated in ferocity. He starved her. He beat her. She was always chained to the bed, and she often fainted. She had regular nosebleeds and often vomited. She had a miscarriage after six weeks. Ironically, after trying to induce an abortion by his own hand, Ariel found this unacceptable, to quote Michelle, and then when I did miscarry, he blamed me. He said I hated him and I killed his kid. He punched me in the face, saying that it was all my fault. After Michelle expelled the fetus, he picked it up and placed it in her hands. He asked her if she wished it were alive. He told her she was to blame for its death. Winters in Ohio can be harsh, and due to the lack of heating in the house, Michelle nearly froze to death. Ariel refused to give her blankets or clothes to keep her warm. As Michelle recalls, it was always very cold. He didn't have heat, and I only had one sheet. It was so cold that my lips would turn blue, and you could see my breath. Castro explained to her that he would not give her blankets and clothes until she proved to him that he could trust her. Michelle rarely bathed during her time of captivity, and she was filthy. It was also rare when he emptied the bucket, leaving her in an atmosphere polluted with the foul stench of bodily wastes. If she disobeyed any of his orders or rules, he would withhold food. He would also brandish his gun, telling her he would kill her if she tried to escape. At Christmas, he gave her a puppy to keep her company. She named it Lobo and bonded with the dog. 
the only exchange of love she experienced during this time. Unfortunately, their relationship was short-lived. One day, while Castro was beating Michelle, Lobo intervened and bit Castro. Ariel picked Lobo up and broke his neck in full view of Michelle. He took the dog out to the backyard and disposed of the body. On Christmas Day, Ariel raped Michelle. He salted her wounds by reminding her that Joey was not with her to celebrate the occasion. Michelle recounted what Ariel said to her. He rubbed it in my face that I wasn't with my son, that I'm spending my holidays with somebody else, and he'd say, he's better off without you. With the advent of a new year, Michelle decided to escape. Ariel brought her downstairs to the bathroom so she could take a shower. While his back was turned, she spotted a needle. She grabbed it and concealed it from him. Having finished her shower, he brought her back to the bedroom and chained her up before departing for work. After she heard him leave, she picked the locks with the needle. Unfortunately, her timing was off. Castro hadn't left. He was still in the backyard. Michelle was halfway out the window before she heard Castro running up the stairs. She panicked and ran back to the bedroom. She put the chains back on and acted as if nothing unusual was afoot. But Ariel suspected something was different. He searched the room carefully until he found the needle under her pillow. He said, What are you doing with this? Michelle told him she had taken to self-mutilation and used the needle to cut her arms. Castro confiscated the needle, telling her he disapproved of such behavior. He also figured out that she attempted to leave when he noticed one of the chains was not reconnected in his usual fashion of attachment. He decided to punish her. He dragged her back down to the basement dungeon. He chained her to the pole. He told her she was not the only captive who had been kept there. He directed her attention to a shrine in the corner. There was a small sign that read, Rest in Peace. Next to these words was a girl's name, which had been scribbled out. Michelle wasn't wearing her glasses at the time, so she couldn't discern whose name was crossed out. Ariel brought Michelle back upstairs a few weeks later. This time he outfitted her with a television to watch. She was tethered to the wall by a three-foot chain, but watching her favorite programs at least soothed her nerves in between the daily sessions of rape and torture. April 2003. Michelle became pregnant with another of Ariel Castro's children. She was terrified of how he would react. It wasn't something that could pass undetected by his radar forever. When it came to his attention, he kicked her in the stomach. He kicked her with so much force she fell backwards against a door. She miscarried ten days later. In between periods of abandonment and abuse, Castro would confide in Michelle. He would bemoan his victimhood status, intimating that he was a childhood victim of abuse. He told her he was obsessed with pornography. He also revealed that he hated African Americans. At one point, he confessed that he regretted not having gotten to John Benet Ramsey first. He also felt cheated out of the fate of being the one to abduct Elizabeth Smart. This was a fixation that consumed him for years, and he wasn't satisfied, not by a long shot. In fact, he was now on the lookout for another girl to abduct and imprison. As Michelle put it, he had an obsession with blondes. He would always say, I've seen this girl and I'm just sad I didn't get her in my car. He would let me know what girl he was trying to abduct and where she worked. Part 3. Amanda Berry Amanda Marie Berry was born on April 22, 1986, in Cleveland. She grew up less than three miles north of Seymour Avenue. Her father, Johnny Berry, had a history of violence and served a sentence in prison for sexual battery and aggravated assault. Her parents separated when she was four years old. She befriended Ariel Castro's daughters, Angie and Emily. Being highly intelligent and conscientious, 
She was a high achiever academically. She also had a reputation as a, quote, girly girl. Her dream was to become a fashion designer. When she was 16, she was hired by Burger King. She spent some of her money on alcohol and marijuana, as she loved to party. 7.36 p.m., Amanda clocked out from her shift at Burger King. Her intention at the time was to have her nails done before heading home. Immediately upon leaving the parking lot, Ariel Castro drove past in his van. His daughter Arlene rode shotgun. He had seen Amanda at the Burger King, and she was exactly the kind of girl to whet his appetite. Young, beautiful, and blonde. After dropping Arlene off at her destination, Ariel made a U-turn and drove back towards the Burger King. As Amanda talked to her sister Beth on her cell phone, Ariel pulled up in his van alongside her. He asked her if she wanted a ride home. Amanda didn't hesitate. Amanda saw Arlene in the van earlier and was surprised to find that she was not there. Before she could comment on this, the driver introduced himself as Ariel Castro. He asked her if she knew his daughter Angie and Ariel Jr., who worked at the same Burger King. She knew both of them. They drove past Amanda's house. She asked him where they were headed. He told her he was taking her to visit Angie at his house. When they arrived, he invited Amanda to see his daughter. Once inside, he led her upstairs. They passed a closed door with a large hole in it. The hole was large enough that Amanda could see a woman inside the room. She asked Castro who it was. He told her she was his roommate. Ariel brought her to a bedroom with an ensuite bathroom. He pinned her against the wall. She became distressed and threatened to notify police if he did not release her. He grabbed her and she started screaming. He pressed his hands to her mouth to muzzle her. He threw her down on the floor and raped her. Having climaxed, he bound her wrists and legs together with duct tape. He taped her mouth shut. He placed a motorcycle helmet over her head. He carried her downstairs to the basement. There, he chained her around the waist to the pole. Once she was secured as his prisoner, he went upstairs, locking the basement door behind him. Amanda's mother, Luana, reported Amanda's disappearance to police. Her friends and boyfriend were interviewed, but nobody had any reliable clues. Ariel Castro listened to the frantic messages on Amanda's cell phone and enjoyed every word. He would even delete messages to make room for more. A few nights after the abduction, Amanda tried to escape. She was no match for Ariel Castro. He held her down, taped her legs together, and applied a strip of duct tape to her mouth. He raped her again, with more aggression and savagery than usual. He reattached her to the pole in the basement and put the motorcycle helmet back on. A day later, Castro brought Amanda upstairs to the bathroom. He raped her there. He followed up by bringing her to a bedroom, and her extremities bound, chained her to a heater. Having securely installed her in this vulnerable position, she became a target, and he raped her whenever the mood struck him. April 28th, Luana Miller appeared on WEWS 5's televised news broadcast at 10 p.m. She appealed to the community to come forward with any leads they might have. Amanda's photo appeared during the segment. One of the viewers was Ariel Castro. A few minutes later, he called Luana from Amanda's cell phone. His communique to her was terse and brief. I have your daughter. She's healthy and okay. Luana asked to speak to Amanda. He hung up. Two minutes later, Ariel called back. Luana recalls how this exchange went. He said Mandy was going to be his wife. He wanted to marry her. Mandy wanted to be with him. And then he hung up and that's the last I heard. Luana called back and left several messages, but received no reply. She contacted FBI Special Agent Robert Hawk and told him what happened. 
He was the leading investigator. He told her it might be a hoax with Amanda's participation. He based this on the notion that she was fine and, quote, would return home in a couple of days. Earlier that night, Ariel burst into Michelle Knight's room, where she was still chained up. He turned on the television. He said to her, If you watch the news tonight, you might find there's a tragedy in Cleveland. When Amanda's face appeared on the screen, she realized Castro, or, quote, the dude, as she had called him, made good on his vow to abduct another girl. When Castro brought Amanda to the house, he instructed Michelle to hide her naked body and chains under a blanket. He introduced her, claiming she was his brother's girlfriend, but Michelle recognized her from the news. She felt sorry for Amanda, who took in the squalid environment in horror. The floor was rank, stinking of urine. Spoiled food, sandwiches and pizza slices, was strewn about in every direction. To quote Michelle, there were flies flying around the room. It was pretty disgusting. When Amanda laid eyes on Michelle, she smiled at her. Michelle speculated on the reasoning behind this. I think she was happy to see there was another person there, and she wasn't alone. Michelle also couldn't help but notice how clean Amanda's attire and overall appearance were. A fleeting state of affairs under Ariel Castro's roof, to be sure. Meanwhile, Michelle was naked and hadn't had a shower in months. Castro brought Amanda to her own room, and the two girls wouldn't see each other again for several months. Ariel stopped inviting his girlfriend Lillian over to his house after one visit when she heard Michelle Knight's television. She asked him who the viewer was. Fearing that she was catching on to what was happening, she was no longer welcome in his home. One day, Castro unlocked Michelle. He took her to Amanda's room. Michelle didn't want to enter because she was naked. To quote Michelle, I didn't want to walk in front of Amanda being naked. And he was like, well, she's got the same thing you have. You can come in the room. Michelle entered the room, and the girls embraced. Castro left them alone for a couple of minutes. Michelle noticed a chain around Amanda's ankle. Amanda tried to conceal it from her view. Michelle reflected on their first conversation. I finally got to see where Amanda was at. We're sitting there. And she told me, I think I remember you from school. I was like, yeah, I remember you. Castro came back minutes later and took Michelle back to her room. He reattached her to the chains. Their bedrooms were adjacent to each other, but they never communicated fearing retaliation from Castro. Even when he was at work, they wouldn't risk it. During the first year of Amanda's confinement, they only saw each other about six times. On many occasions, Amanda would cry and Michelle would comfort her. As Michelle recalled, I'd tell her everything will be okay, that one day we'll get home. Amanda was treated better than Michelle. Amanda received better food, and her room was in better condition. To quote Michelle, he will always say, I don't want to make her cry. I don't want to make her upset. He would try and make her happy instead of sad. He treated her halfway decent and let her have whatever she wanted because she was the new girl. The way Michelle saw it, her utility in his life was as a punching bag and a sex toy. If Amanda refused to have sex with Ariel, he would gratify himself with Michelle's body. Michelle said he would say something to her to the effect of, Well, she won't do it, so you have to. To quote Michelle, And if I didn't do it, he would force it on me. During summer, there was no air conditioning. In these conditions, Michelle became pregnant for the third time. The heat in her room was overwhelming. Castro didn't induce a miscarriage for a few months after her most recent fetus was conceived. When he did, he employed such tactics as starving her for weeks. He also nudged the process along by punching and jumping on her stomach. 
When Luana appeared on the news, Michelle would crank the volume as high as it could go so that Amanda could hear it. Immediately following the segment's finale, she would turn the volume back down to what had become its default position. During one such broadcast, Luana said, It's just getting harder and harder to know that your daughter fell off the face of the earth and nobody knows where she's at. If anybody knows anything about my daughter, please come forward. Because somebody out there knows something. After the segment ended, Ariel laughed. He taunted Michelle, saying, You see that? At least somebody's looking for her. But who's looking for you? Not a soul. That's because you don't mean nothing to nobody. Fifteen months after Michelle's disappearance was reported, the FBI's National Crime Information Center removed her name from its database of missing persons. They were unable to get in touch with Barbara to ask if Michelle had been located. Ariel broke up with Lillian Rolden in October. He was hatching plans to abduct a third girl. That, and he was juggling his bus driving job with music gigs. He found little time to devote to a relationship based in mutual respect and consent. That just wasn't his forte. One day in late March, Ariel burst into Michelle Knight's room and freed her from the chains. He informed her that a new girl would soon enter their inner sanctum. Michelle was ordered to assist him as he prepared another bedroom for the new girl's incarceration. As Michelle put it, I had to help drill holes in the wall to put the chains through to hook us together. He had told me he was bringing somebody in the house and to be very quiet. Part 4. Georgina de Jesus Georgina de Jesus, commonly known as Gina, was the daughter of Felix de Jesus, who had gone to school with Ariel Castro. At the age of 14, Gina's best friend was Arlene Castro. Gina was enrolled in special education classes as she struggled with a learning disability and was still learning how to read. April 2nd, Arlene and Gina were walking home from school. Their plan was to go to Gina's house for a few hours of recreation. Arlene called her mother for permission, but Nilda denied her consent, as Arlene was grounded for wayward behavior. The girls went their separate ways. Minutes later, Ariel Castro pulled up at Wilbur Wright Middle School, attended by both girls. He was looking for Arlene. He asked a security guard for permission to enter the school but did not find her there. When he came out, he got in his car and drove through the streets looking for her. Years later, he told police that he had sex on his mind whenever he saw Gina. He was particularly taken with the dimensions of her chest. After passing both girls, he saw that they were walking in different directions, Gina to the east, Arlene to the west. He made a U-turn and drove up to Gina. He asked her if she knew where Arlene was. Gina told him she was walking home. Ariel asked her if she would help him find Arlene. She recognized him, so she got in. As he drove, he asked her if she would help him move a speaker into his house. She agreed to help him. When they arrived at Ariel's house, he led her in through the back door. Once they were inside, he took her upstairs. He told her he no longer needed help with the speaker. He took her into the bathroom. He looked at himself in the mirror. Satisfied, he asked Gina to show him, quote, her privates. Gina was not comfortable with this, and she told him she wanted to leave. Castro told her she could leave, but not through the door through which they entered. Castro somehow duped Gina into going to the basement. Once he lured her all the way down, he launched his attack. He placed plastic ties on her wrists and chained her to the pole. With her securely attached, he raped her. She screamed and fought back with all the will left inside of her, but it was all in vain. When Castro was finished with her, he placed the motorcycle helmet over her head. He left her at the pole. 
She wept as he left and for quite some time afterward. Ariel told Michelle to be quiet because there was a new girl in the house and he didn't want to scare her away. When Michelle heard the girl's cries for help, she prayed for her. Michelle recalled details of Gina's captivity and the abuse Castro visited upon her. All I hear is fighting in the basement and a girl screaming for help. I could hear things crash and I could hear someone screaming, get off of me, get off of me, and nobody helps her. Part 5. Business as Usual Gina's mother reported her missing to the police. After checking with hospitals and the morgue, the police had no leads. The last person to see her alive was Arlene Castro, who was interviewed about her disappearance. Her family and friends posted missing posters all over Cleveland's west side. According to community activist Khalid Samad, Ariel Castro assisted with the search as the volunteers canvassed around the community. He even passed out flyers. At one point, the FBI got involved. All the attention from media and law enforcement that the Gina de Jesus case attracted made Ariel Castro uneasy. He became highly paranoid. He remembered that there were cameras stationed at Wilbur Wright's school and that they may have footage of him creeping about soon before he kidnapped Gina. He dreaded the day when the police would put two and two together and arrive at 2207 Seymour Avenue, his house of horrors. Late that Sunday, he wrote a four-page confession in cursive. The following are the verbatim contents of that letter. April 4, 2004. To the best of my knowledge, I was born in PR. I was abandoned by my father and later my mother. My grandma raised me. I was abused sexually by the son of Louis and Philia. His name is Pucho. He penetrated my rear a couple of times. I was five or six years old. I soon learned how to masturbate. I was interested in sex at a very young age. Sex has always been a too big part of my life. I married at age 20. I lived a normal life with my wife and children, but my marriage was a failure from the beginning. My mother was an abusive parent. Her ways of discipline were very bad. For this made me grow hatred for her. There were times I wished she would die. Anyway, my marriage was abusive also. My wife would hit on me and push me to the limit. I hit her back. She put me in jail only to go get me out and apologize to me. This happened a couple of times, but the name calling and arguments were always there. I tried to reason with her that the kids did not need to see or hear the arguments or fights. I felt bad to see my children frightened and scared. My wife always said she didn't give a shit if they were, and what he said was indecipherable, or not. The marriage lasted about 12 years. I always loved and still love my children. About six years ago, my wife left for another man. I didn't mind as long as my kids, and what he wrote was indecipherable here, and in a good home. This man did nothing for the children. I kept taking this in, but they were better off with their mother. I can't understand why this man took the trouble to finish raising my kids when he knew I was in a relationship as a father. My ex-wife has many problems with this man and just can't get out of the relationship. I lived alone for the most part after my marriage. I had a good sex drive. I was in a relationship with an indecipherable woman. I cared, another indecipherable word. I met a woman at Family Dollar on Clark. The woman needed a ride somewhere. I, indecipherable word, brought her to my home. Michelle has been there ever since, about two years. I got another opportunity to get another woman, indecipherable word, in my van. This girl is Amanda, indecipherable word. On West 110, walking home a short distance, I asked her if she needed a ride home, and she said yes. I, indecipherable word, brought her to my house. She has been there for about a year, smoking her pot cigarettes that I provide, indecipherable word. 
These two women accepted money for sex. I treat them well and make sure they eat good. I don't understand why I keep looking for women out in the street, as I already had two in my possession. One day I was driving down Lorraine Avenue, and near 105, a woman was walking. I asked her if she needed a ride. She agreed. I calmly drove her to my house. This girl is Georgina. I asked her to come inside. She said yes. These women are here against their will because they made a mistake by getting in a car with a total stranger. I had no idea Gina was so young. She looks a lot older. Also, not knowing she is the daughter of Felix, a school classmate of mine. The bottom line is I am a sexual predator who needs help, but I don't bother to get it. I live a private life. I function around others like a normal person. I've been having problems with my head for a long time. I feel depressed, dizzy, and short-term memory loss. I really, indecipherable word, know what's wrong with me. To the parents of these three women, I would like to say I'm very sorry. I am sick. Five years ago, I was diagnosed with a cyst in my brain. I don't know if this is what made me behave the way I do, not have any feelings for the bad things I have done. I can, indecipherable word, the public. These three women are the only ones I have done harm to, holding them against their will. Indecipherable word, when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like I'm really here. This is a big problem in my everyday life. I want to put an end to my life and let the devil deal with me. I feel so bad about the age of Gina. I will admit I did molest her but did not rape her. I actually feel the closeness to her and her parents. I do not have the urge to touch her. I feel it's wrong. Anyway, my intentions are to let these women go when I feel I have arranged everything. So my family knows what to do after I take my life. I have a dollar bank account with about $10,875.21. And I have cash. $10,000. And I have cash. About 11000 in cash. 11000 under the washer machine. That's it. Do not look for any more money. There isn't any more. My family will need to know this. I would like the money to go to the three victims, for they deserve every red cent of it. Again, I apologize, sorry, to everyone this whole ordeal has affected. To my children, please be strong and make the right decisions. Just because you may think you know someone, do not get into their vehicle. This was the case of Amanda and Gina. Nilda, please do your best to ensure my babies are safe. If possible, move away, far away. As I write this letter on 4404, 205 p.m., my symptoms are clearly bothering me. Dizziness and not feeling like I'm here. Also, depression. I know I am sick, mentally. However much urgency Castro may have felt when driven to write this document, it remained folded and stored in a drawer for the next nine years. The De Jesus house became the headquarters of the family and citizen-run search. Felix and Nancy administered to the numerous volunteers who did their part to help bring Gina back to her family and her abductor to justice. One afternoon, Ariel Castro paid a visit. He hugged Nancy and offered her his sympathy. He took a bunch of flyers with him when he departed. The community became gravely concerned by what appeared to be a pattern of crimes committed by a serial offender. Parents were afraid to allow their daughters to walk alone in public. Municipal politicians were addressing the issue. At one point, local media referred to Cleveland's west side as the Bermuda Triangle. Michelle Knight was following the case on the television news. She recognized Gina. She was her friend Myra's younger sister. She asked Castro if he kidnapped a 14-year-old girl. He denied it. To quote Michelle, he would come to my room and tell me, I didn't take her. And I'll look up at him and say, you're a damn liar. I know you took that girl. A tip was submitted to the FBI about Fernando Colon fingering him as a suspect in Gina de Jesus's disappearance. 
Many have speculated that it was Castro who submitted this tip. He did swear revenge on him multiple times, after all. After a polygraph exam and forensic analysis cleared Cologne of culpability, Fernando encouraged them to redirect their microscope at Ariel Castro. He told them Castro knew Gina's parents and where they resided. The FBI ignored this advice. Years later, they denied that Cologne advised them to investigate Ariel Castro as a suspect. The search went federal when the cases of Gina De Jesus and Amanda Berry were profiled on America's Most Wanted. Ariel declined to play a music gig so that he could stay home and watch the segment. He was so pleased with himself for outsmarting law enforcement that he bought himself an SUV with inheritance money his father left him. Castro decided to introduce Michelle Knight and Gina De Jesus. He told Michelle his daughter was coming to visit and he wanted them to meet. He introduced Knight and De Jesus to each other in a bathroom. Michelle recalled how their first exchange went. I whispered into her ear, You're Gina De Jesus. And she looked at me and she was like, You know who I am? Michelle gave Gina some advice on how to deal with Castro. As Gina recounted, I told her not to tell him that I know who you are, that there will be consequences to you telling him. She promised she would tell her more the next time they met. When Castro returned to the bathroom, he told Gina to tie Michelle's hair into twists. He remained in the room so he could watch. When Michelle thanked Gina for making her hair look beautiful, Castro became enraged. He brought both of them upstairs. He chained Michelle to the bed in the pink bedroom. He took Gina to the basement. Days later, he moved Gina to one of the bedrooms. He pinned one of her missing persons posters on the wall. One evening, Castro got drunk and offered Michelle a few shots of rum. She declined. He took a large swig for himself. He regaled her with his story about how he used to follow a young girl home from Wilbur Wright's school every day. He told her she looked like Gina and that he often got the two confused. As Michelle recalled, he said he didn't know that he'd kidnapped his daughter's friend until he saw Gina's name on the news. Castro Sr. brought Gina into the pink bedroom with Michelle in tow. A few days earlier, he removed the bucket into which Michelle had been relieving herself and replaced it with another. They served as putrid time capsules that marked the years of torture and suffering that felt like decades to both girls. A filthy and rank queen-size mattress had been dropped on the floor. Castro ordered both girls to lay on the mattress. He attached a padlocked chain around Michelle's neck, with the other end being attached to Gina's ankle. Gina asked him how she was supposed to relieve herself while chained to Michelle's neck. He unlocked the chains and shackled their feet together. He threw t-shirts and sweatpants on the bed for Michelle, who was still naked. He left them bound together for the night. Throughout the summer, Michelle Knight and Gina De Jesus formed a strong emotional bond as partners in captivity. What started as a friendship developed into a sisterhood. They shared all aspects of their lives as free citizens and commiserated about the various tortures and indignities visited upon them by Ariel Castro. They watched a lot of television together. Michelle warned Gina to never watch programs in which African Americans featured prominently, which was guaranteed to trigger Castro's wrath. Another way Castro kept the girls occupied was by giving them notebooks and implements for writing and illustration. They kept diaries and drew pictures to distract themselves from the horrors of their confinement. Occasionally Castro would spy on them to get a sense of what they said about him. Naturally, when they did talk about him, they had nothing complimentary to say. Michelle described the content of her writings. I wrote every day. Poems. Songs. Dreams of how I wished everything could be different. Michelle would even make lists of provisions she would need for imaginary camping trips. Her reality was almost unendurable, so the realm of imagination and fantasy proved to be a very necessary escape hatch. Amanda kept three different journals. 
In the Blue Journal, she wrote about the sexual abuse Castro inflicted on her. In a journal entitled Miss Shady Handcrafted Items, she wrote personal notes and illustrations. The Black Journal was called Love. In that book, she characterized herself as a prisoner of war. She also took to writing letters to her mother every day. She constantly wrote about her longing for a reunion. Attorney Craig Weintraub described the contents of the journals. The journals have extreme detail, and parts of them are very graphic about what occurred inside the house. The journals describe their relationships with each other and Castro. The food, the clothing, the bathroom, the shower, the television, and the chains, and sex. Part of Castro's nightly routine was to go into the pink bedroom to rape and beat the girls. As one was raped or beaten, she held the hand of the other for comfort. He would beat Michelle harder than Gina. Michelle described the physical abuse. Hers were more like a smack. Mine was more like a fist. There were times that he would hit her too, and I would jump in front of her and take the hit. Castro began to refer to Amanda Berry his favorite of the three girls, as his wife. He gave her a brand new color television. At night, while Michelle and Gina were bound within the dirty and foul-smelling environs of the pink bedroom, Amanda accompanied Castro downstairs, where they would watch television together. After informing Michelle and Gina of the so-called marriage, he began taking them out to the backyard. The yard was a veritable scrap heap of barbed wire, rusted chains, and plastic tarps. He raped them in that mess. Michelle speculated on his motivation for abusing them in this location. This made me wonder if, in his twisted mind, maybe he thought he should try to hide from her all the sex he was still having with me. He kept on raping Gina, too. April 21st, it was the second anniversary of Amanda's abduction, and in Ariel Castro's twisted mind, it was cause for celebration. He served birthday cake to all three girls. A dubious gesture, to say the least. It was much better than the cold, stale hamburgers and pizza slices to which they were accustomed to eating. It's just that two years of rape, beatings, and the health risks posed to the girls from the squalid surroundings were nothing to be feted. Castro made some minor improvements in the conditions of the girls' existence. They were no longer chained up at all hours of the day. They were free enough to be able to walk around their rooms. They were not permitted to see daylight. He boarded up the windows with reinforced plexiglass and strips of wood. He still disallowed them from using the bathroom downstairs. They were still forced to relieve themselves in buckets, which were seldom emptied. Showers were rare, and the environment was so filthy by that point that it was unsafe for human habitation. Indeed, the mattress on which Michelle and Gina slept was such a nauseating petri dish of dirt and bodily fluids that it gave them bed sores. Castor also employed tactics of psychological terrorism. He delighted in raping and beating the girls in sight of the other. He would also play cruel mind games. For example, he might tell them he was going out, only to stand outside the door and wait. If one of the girls tried to open the door, he would beat her and chain her to the basement pole. Michelle commented on his games. He used to play tremendous dumb games. He'll leave the door unlocked, and he'll sit there and say, Well, if you try anything, I'll hang you upside down. Or he'll threaten to hurt somebody else in the house. Other punishments included neglect, such as withholding food and beverages. He would also remove the buckets. He would place the girls in the basement during the coldest points of winter, or situate them in the attic during a heat wave in summer. He installed mirrors all over the house. They helped him monitor the situation. He drilled peepholes in the bedroom doors so he could spy on the girls. He constantly carried his gun with him and warned them, that he would shoot them for any infraction. The worst of his mind games involved the gun. He would engage them all in a game of Russian roulette. The gun wasn't loaded, but the girls didn't know that. 
Another thing that made a traumatic impact on the girls psychologically was watching how life on the outside evolved as they watched television. To quote Michelle, I felt like everything was frozen. Nothing was moving at all. The only thing that was moving was the outside world, and we were at a standstill. One Sunday morning before dawn, Castro brought the girls into the garage. He provided all three of them with wigs and sunglasses so that they would not be recognized by neighbors. After all, the girls' faces had been featured in news stories and missing person posters for months after they were abducted. Some of Castro's relatives were due to pay him a visit. The girls were confined in his van. He locked it from the outside with chains and padlocks. Michelle reported that the van was infected by a putrid odor. Their bindings were loose enough for them to use a pot as a toilet. They were not able to look out of the windows. Before he left them alone, Castro warned them, If I hear a sound, I will come out here and kill all three of you. When he returned, he brought them back into the house. They wouldn't leave for another eight years. At Christmas, Luana Miller died of pancreatitis and other illnesses. Her sister Teresa Miller said she died of a broken heart. After all the stress, she would say, I can't eat. I don't know if Mandy ate. My sister was a very strong person, but it took a lot out of her. Michelle and Gina learned of Luana's passing from the news. Hours later, Castro removed the chains from Michelle and Gina. He allowed them to walk around the second floor. Michelle walked to Amanda's bedroom. She entered and expressed her condolences about her mother. Amanda was baffled. She asked her what she was talking about. It was now incumbent upon Michelle to be the bearer of bad tidings and inform Amanda about her mother's demise. Amanda wept. Michelle recalled what happened. I backed out of the door wanting to give her some peace and quiet. When I was back on my mattress, I could hear her sobbing. I felt so terrible for Amanda and so furious this man had stolen her from her family. Not long after losing her mother because of Ariel Castro, Amanda became pregnant with his child. With or without the baby bump, the signs were there. Morning sickness had her vomiting all over her room. One day when the girls were having breakfast in the kitchen, Amanda complained about feeling nauseous. At night, Castro approached Michelle to ask her if she thought Amanda might be pregnant. Michelle told him it was in the realm of possibility. This got a different reaction than when he found out she was pregnant. He smiled. He seemed truly pleased. Michelle told him he should take better care of her during her pregnancy. Still, being that Amanda was Ariel's favorite, she assumed he would want to keep the baby and do all he could to ensure it would be born. Throughout Amanda's pregnancy, Ariel was keen to keep her away from Michelle and Gina. The precautions he took were effective, and they seldom saw her. Castro's treatment of Michelle Knight was worse than ever. He fed her once a day, and the food was typically stale and cold. Leftovers, mostly. She was permitted to shower only once a week. She was still designated as official punching bag and he beat her savagely on a regular basis. It didn't take much to provoke him. He would also abuse her emotionally, tell her she was ugly. One day Amanda asked Castro why he singled out Michelle for such vicious maltreatment. He told her he disliked her. Michelle's perspective. He was the type of person who wanted to break everyone in the house, and I was considered unbreakable. Indeed, Michelle was the only one of the three girls who stood up to him. When she did, he would issue fearsome threats. He would warn her that he would cut her uterus open, end to end. He showed her a black chain that he told her he would tie through it. He hung it on the door of her room as a reminder of the fate she would meet should she defy him any further. She also protected Gina as much as she could. Nothing Ariel Castro did could whittle down Michelle Knight's strength and courage. Amanda was not aware of all the tortures to which Castro subjected the other girls, and her perspective on their captivity was colored by her standpoint of relative privilege. As Michelle put it, 
She was like one of those girls that really didn't get it. She would see it, but she wouldn't believe it. She wants to think that it wasn't happening. He treated her totally different. So she looked at the situation in a different way. Castro tied Michelle and Gina to the pole in the basement while relatives were visiting. Once they left, Castro returned to the basement and removed the duct tape from their mouths. He gave them some food. Having finished with this, he went back upstairs and left the girls behind in the basement, where they remained for three weeks. They were given some respite from their confinement in the basement when Castro brought them, one by one, upstairs for rape. He would bring the girl back down afterwards. Castro eventually brought them all back upstairs, with Michelle and Gina in the pink room and Amanda in the white room. December. Amanda entered the third trimester of her pregnancy. Michelle became pregnant for the fourth time. She was petrified of how Castro would react. It wasn't something she could deny. Her nipples were already secreting milk of their own volition. When Castro found out, he starved her for three weeks. He forced her to drink gallons of soda pop. As Michelle recalled, I started to throw up and couldn't keep anything down. I would try and steal food just to eat. Castro forbade her from leaving the pink room. She was not allowed to go to the kitchen, and Gina was not allowed to feed her. To quote Michelle, she'll do it anyway because she didn't want me to hurt. Nausea and pain made the pregnancy a hell on earth for Michelle. Unable to tolerate it any longer, Ariel punched and kicked her in the stomach until the baby was aborted. Christmas Day, Amanda Berry went into labor. Ariel Castro decided that the ideal conditions in which to give birth were in the basement. He deputized Michelle in the role of midwife. Amanda was provided with a plastic children's wading pool to sit in to ensure the filthy floor of the basement wouldn't be tainted with afterbirth. After pushing and pushing, the baby's head appeared. Amanda pushed again, but the baby's head became stuck. It was strangled by the diminutive circumference, and it turned blue. Michelle told her to stop pushing. Amanda told her she couldn't stop. Michelle told her the baby was blue, but she supported her as Amanda pushed the infant out. The baby was stillborn. Ariel Castro was enraged. He screamed at Michelle, blaming her and threatening to kill her if the child did not survive. While performing CPR on Amanda and Ariel's baby daughter, Castro continued to utter death threats to Michelle. The baby began to scream. Ariel named her Jocelyn. He kept the placenta in his refrigerator as a memento. Amanda was emancipated from her chains. Castro felt it wouldn't be appropriate for the child to see her mother in chains. Michelle and Gina remained bound for the next two years. The child was moved to Amanda's bedroom, where she cared for her. The presence of the baby lifted the overall mood in the house, though Castro wasn't elated enough to put a stop to the rape and beatings to which he subjected Michelle and Gina. In his warped perspective, they were all a family. Despite having four of her own children beaten to death in utero, Michelle was still able to appreciate this situation. It was just so amazing to bring a new life into the world, but it was also traumatic at the same time. I knew that if I didn't get her to breathe, that he would have killed me right then and there. With the baby in the house lifting everybody's spirits, the girls hoped that it would inspire Castro to improve their own living conditions. The one change that occurred was he treated Michelle and Gina better when the baby was around. When Jocelyn grew into a toddler, Ariel instructed Michelle and Gina to use aliases whenever she came around. He felt that if she knew their names, she might recognize them from television. Amanda was allowed to use her real name. He removed their chains, and from time to time, he would let them walk around the house. This was only done under his strict supervision. He made sure to keep his gun within sight as well. Michelle commented on his motivation behind this action. He didn't do it out of the kindness of his heart. It was because Jocelyn was getting old enough to understand what was happening around her. 
They all had dinner together every night after Castro returned home from work. Gina did the cooking. Michelle would hold and rock Jocelyn to help her stop crying. Amanda played the usual role of wife, talking to Castro about his day. Sometimes they gathered together in the living room. There they would watch Castro's favorite television program, Keeping Up with the Kardashians. He was fond of making obscene remarks about Kim Kardashian. Michelle and Gina spent some of their free time making clothing for Jocelyn. They took old dirty t-shirts and sewed the cannibalized fragments together into single garments. Castro provided old toys for her to play with. He vowed to buy her clothing from stores, but never did. Michelle commented on the bizarre family dynamic Castro believed existed in his home of hostages. In his own demented mind, he loved all of us because he thought we were all family. That goes back to his fake world, where he wanted a family and he didn't have it. He always complained how his family had abandoned him. She was still the only one in the house who would stand up to him and refused to play the charade of the happy ersatz family, and she bore the brunt of his displeasure. He spat in her face. He punched her. He humiliated her in front of the other girls, calling her worthless and telling her nobody was looking for her. He would say things like, What's wrong with you? You're supposed to be happy. November. Ariel Castro's neighbor, Anita Lugo, heard a sound coming from his house, a pounding sound. She looked up and saw a woman and a baby in a window. The window was half boarded up with wood. She notified the police. Michelle Knight remembered this all too well. That was me. I was trying to get out. The police did pay a visit. One officer knocked on the front door several times. They walked around the side of the house. Nobody responded, so they left. Not long after this incident, another of Castro's neighbors, Juan Perez, was in his basement with his sister when they heard screaming coming from the direction of Ariel Castro's basement. They called police. As Perez recalled, it was the kind of scream that made you uncomfortable. It gave us goosebumps and went on for 10 seconds. Perez had been under the impression that the Castro house was vacant since the windows were boarded up and sightings of Castro were rare. The police came to investigate, but when nobody answered the door, they left. Neighbor Ariel Lugo reported seeing a girl staring out of one of Ariel Castro's windows. They reported it to the police, who came, knocked on the door, got no response, and left. Lugo's niece saw a naked girl wearing a dog collar in Ariel Castro's backyard. It wasn't long after this incident when neighbors saw three naked girls in Castro's backyard. Lugo described the scene. They were naked on all fours, with a leash and collar on them, and they were being abused. Lugo's niece called the police, but they never came. The following day, Castro installed an eight-foot fence with chicken wire. It was covered with a blue tarp. He allowed the trees and brush to grow tall as the final effort to block his neighbor's view of his backyard. Another way he kept the heat off him was to participate in candlelight vigils and group prayers for the benefit of the girls' families. Nilda Figueroa died on April 25, 2012, of the brain cancer that Ariel Castro inflicted on her. As Alita Carabello put it, All my family blames him for my sister's death. He put her six feet under. Adding insult to injury, Ariel and one of his brothers went to the funeral. Nilda's family were horrified to see her executioner at the ceremony. They were even more horrified when he helped himself to generous portions of liquor and cracked jokes. To quote Alida, I saw him at my sister's funeral. He's disgusting to me, the way he treated my sister. A quote from Ariel Jr.'s epitaph for his mother. Dear Mom, you were gone too soon, but your suffering is over. The summer of 2012 was sweltering in Cleveland, 
And to make the situation even worse for Michelle and Gina, they were bitten by bed bugs every day. It's no wonder. Though Castro got them a new mattress, it was only new in the sense that they hadn't used it before. He found it in an alley. It was filthy and stained with blood and semen. When Michelle brought the bed bug infestation to Castro's attention, he reacted by closing the door of Amanda and Jocelyn's bedroom to prevent Amanda and Jocelyn from suffering the bites. He did cover the mattress with a sheet of plastic, but this did nothing, for it did not seal the mattress inside effectively. Endless perspiration and insect bites. Michelle Knight and Gina De Jesus were living like prisoners of war. September. Michelle became pregnant for the fifth time. One day, Castro took Jocelyn to a carnival. When he returned, he brought hot dogs slathered in mustard. Michelle had a severe allergy to mustard that was life-threatening. Her mother once brought her to a trauma center after she ate some deviled eggs. Ingesting mustard could be fatal for her. Castro knew this. She refused to eat the McDonald's hamburgers unless he told the staff to hold the mustard. Nevertheless, he gave her the hot dog with the mustard. When she refused to eat it, he threw it on her mattress. He took out his gun. He threatened to shoot her if she didn't eat it. She wiped off the mustard with her t-shirt as best she could, but the meat still absorbed some of it. Immediately her face swelled up and she began to asphyxiate. Castro told her to get over it. He left the room, locking it as he left. The suffering didn't end there. Michelle's guts were wrenching from the effects of digesting mustard. At one point, it was more than she could endure, and she believed she was about to die. Her body turned red from head to toe. Her tongue and throat were numb. Several days later, Castro gave her some cough syrup, but of course this did nothing to alleviate her distress. To quote Michelle, I told Gina, just kill me. Just put the pillow over my head and kill me. Let me go. Gina refused to do this. She urged Michelle to stay alive for Joey. Gina nursed Michelle throughout her lengthy recovery. She coached her, encouraging her to stay strong and fight for her life. Ariel Castro was fired from his job after four serious violations of rules by which the school board required him to abide. Castro commented on this years later, I started slacking off, trying to get fired because I knew it was just too much. This job was too stressful, and coming home to my situation, and I just couldn't juggle both of them. This wasn't just bad news for Castro. He became depressed, and his outlook turned rancid. He was more violent toward the girls than ever. As Michelle noted, now he was at home all the time. He assaulted me all hours of the day and night. It got even worse after he was fired from his band. Relief only came when he took Jocelyn out for regular excursions. Michelle Knight was three months pregnant at the time of Jocelyn's sixth birthday. After the party was over, Castro ordered Michelle to walk down to the basement. Before descending from the top step, Castro pushed her with all his strength. She landed stomach first on the side of a bookcase. Castro came down to where she lay and started shouting at her. He told her he was going to fix her once and for all. His plan was to prevent her from getting pregnant ever again. Wearing heavy boots, he kicked her in the stomach with all the force he could muster. Michelle begged him not to kill her baby. This only exacerbated the rage that drove him onward, and he kicked her again in the stomach. He capped this off by hitting her in the side of her head with an open hand. He went back upstairs, leaving Michelle splayed out on the floor of the filthy basement, screaming from the excruciating pain he inflicted on her. Ariel blasted salsa music on the stereo to drown out the sound of Michelle crying and screaming, but it was not sufficient. He returned to the basement and threatened to kill her if she didn't stop. He dragged her up two flights of stairs to her room. Four days later, Michelle began to bleed profusely. Castro took her to the bathroom. He said to her, You better hope that baby is dead. 
he left her alone and slammed the door behind him. Michelle got on the toilet, and after waves of convulsions, her fetus fell in the water. While Castro stood outside the door, screaming at her to hurry, Michelle picked the dead baby out of the toilet. She apologized to it. Castro barged in the room and slapped Michelle. She dropped the baby. He screamed at her. It's your fault. You aborted my baby. I should go and get my gun and blow your head off right now. He didn't make good on that threat, but he did put the fetus in a garbage bag and put it in one of the cans in back of his house. When he returned, he took Michelle back to the pink room. He threw some napkins on her mattress and ordered her to clean herself up. Part 6. Emancipation May 6th, 4 p.m. Ariel stopped by the pink room to inform Michelle and Gina that he was going to his mother's house for dinner. Following this, Jocelyn ran up and down the stairs, yelling, Daddy's gone to Grandma's house. Daddy's gone to Grandma's house. She ran into Amanda's room and said, Daddy told me to come up here and stay. Amanda's first instinct was to abstain from reacting. It occurred to her that it might be another ploy to catch her in an escape attempt. She took a look out a window and saw that Castro's car was gone. Amanda's bedroom door was unlocked, as always, so she went downstairs. When she tried opening the front door, she was shocked to find out that it too was unlocked. She took a deep breath. She opened the door. It was sealed shut with a three-panel screen door, which was chain-locked from the outside. Amanda spotted Aurora Marti and two of her neighbors sitting on the porch of the house directly across the street. Amanda began pounding on the glass aggressively to attract their attention. It didn't work, as Amanda recalled later. I kept hitting the glass, but the glass was so thick it wouldn't break. She started screaming, Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. She stuck her hand through the narrow opening between the door and the frame and waved it frantically. The neighbors walked over. One of them told her to break the glass on the screen door. She pounded it several times, but it was impervious to such a means of disintegration. Another man came up and told her to kick out the bottom panel, knowing that it was the thinnest one. He helped her by kicking it from the outside. After several kicks, the frame bended and Amanda pushed it out. She crawled out and reached back in for Jocelyn. Amanda was terrified that Castro would return. He went to his mother's to collect food and return with it, not to stay and eat. She wasted no time. She asked one of the neighbors if she could use their telephone. She called 911. Her dialogue with the operator went as follows. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. What's going on there? I've been kidnapped. I've been missing 10 years. I'm here. I'm free now. Then Amanda asked the dispatcher to send help immediately before her captors return. Who's the guy who went out? His name is Ariel Castro. How old is he? He's like 52. I'm Amanda Berry. I've been in the news for the last 10 years. And you said, what's his name again? Ariel Castro. And is he white, black, or Hispanic? Hispanic. What's he wearing? I don't know because he's not here right now. Okay, the police are on their way. Talk to them when they get there. Michelle and Gina heard a pounding sound coming from downstairs. The neighborhood had its share of home invasions, so they assumed it could be a burglar. They heard a man's voice say, Cleveland Police! Cleveland Police. The girls didn't know if it was a ruse used by a criminal, but then they heard the sound of a police radio. A few seconds later, officers Anthony Espada and Barbara Johnson flashed their badges in the doorway. It was too dark in the room for them to see anything. Espada said, Is anyone in here? Michelle came running out of the room. She leapt into his arms. Barbara recalled this scenario. She just kept repeating, You saved us. You saved us. I told her, It's okay, honey. You're safe. She then jumped in my arms as I'm trying to reholster my weapon. 
Amanda Berry described Castro's car to the police. He was found in the parking lot of a McDonald's. Ariel seemed unfazed by his detention. He said nothing. When Gina de Jesus came forward, the officers didn't recognize her. To quote Officer Johnson, she was a lot thinner and pale compared to the pictures. She had real short hair and was real thin and pale, but you could see the resemblance. I thought she was a little girl until I put her down and got a good look at her and realized she was a grown woman. She was very, very scared. Michelle hugged me first, then clutched me and said, Don't let me go. You can't really describe how I felt. It rips the heart out of my chest. Espada has said that he will never forget that moment. As he recalls, I've broken down crying a few times in private since then. Those three girls are my heroes. After what they went through in that house all those years. All this was overwhelming for Michelle. She began to hyperventilate. Johnson requested an ambulance from dispatch. In hospital, doctors examined Michelle. Her jaw was still injured from being punched by Castro countless times, including one occasion with a barbell. There was neuropathy, or nerve damage, in both of her arms from the beatings. Due to years of eating rotten food between bouts of starvation, she had a bacterial infection that, if left untreated, could have killed her. 7 p.m., Gina de Jesus' mother, Nancy Ruiz, heard a rumor that her daughter was found alive in Ariel Castro's house. She fell to the ground. She shouted, Matalo, which means kill him. She described the experience of reuniting with her daughter at Metro Health Medical Center. We just grabbed each other and held on. There were no words. It was just hugging and kissing and crying. Amanda was visited by her sister. Sadly, Michelle received no visitors except a victim's advocate. Ariel Castro was transported from Cleveland City Jail to police headquarters to give the first of two interviews. Deputy Sheriff David Jacobs of the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office led the investigation. Castro was interviewed in the sex crimes unit. Castro was cooperative, answering every question he was asked without demanding to be represented by an attorney. He was honest and candid, characterizing himself as a sexual predator. He said, I'm the criminal and I knew what I did was wrong. He acknowledged that the details given by the girls about their abductions and captivity were true. One notable error was when he portrayed the sex he had with Michelle Knight as consensual. He also told them that he was only aware of one pregnancy and that they created an abortion plan with mutual input, which consisted of a tea diet, as well as heavy exercises like knee bends and jumping jacks. He later said that the sex he had with Gina de Jesus was also consensual. Despite this deception, he had no illusions about his ultimate fate. He said, I know I am going away for a long time. He identified the victims in photographs. The only mercy he ever showed the three girls emerged in this phase of his confession. He said he wanted all his money and property to be divided among the victims equally. Castro gave another prediction about his destiny. He told Jacobs he was contemplating suicide. To quote Castro, I just want to crash through the window. At a preliminary hearing, a judge set Castro's bail at $8 million to ensure he would not pose a threat to the community. Castro was placed on suicide watch for a while. During that time, he took to walking around his cell in the nude. Eventually, he was taken off the so-called razor list. June 7th, a Cuyahoga County grand jury unanimously indicted Ariel Castro on 329 counts. This only covered the period of the abduction and incarceration of Michelle Knight. Among the charges were two counts of aggravated murder for unlawful termination of a pregnancy, 139 counts of rape, 177 counts of kidnapping, seven counts of gross sexual imposition, three counts of felonious assault, 
one count of possessing criminal tools. On behalf of Castro, the attorneys for the defense entered pleas of not guilty. June 12th, Ariel Castro was brought into court for his arraignment. He had a smirk on his face. The defense, as was their right, waived the reading of what was, on that occasion, a 329-count indictment. They told the judge Castro was pleading not guilty to all charges. Amanda Berry developed post-traumatic stress disorder. She often woke screaming from nightmares in which Ariel Castro was pursuing her. Michelle and Gina also developed this affliction. June 19th, Ariel Castro attended a pre-trial hearing. Castro and his lawyers indicated that he didn't intend to put the girls through a long and stressful trial. A Cleveland Courage Fund raised a million dollars to benefit the three girls as they set forth to rebuild their lives. At a competency hearing, Ariel Castro requested visits with Jocelyn. The judge did not grant this wish, deeming it inappropriate. July 12th, a grand jury emerged with a 977-count indictment of Ariel Castro. The charges, 512 counts of kidnapping, 446 counts of rape, 7 counts of gross sexual imposition, 6 counts of child endangerment, 1 count of possessing criminal tools, 2 counts of aggravated murder from the original indictment. Castro pleaded not guilty and waived the right to have the charges read. The death penalty was considered, but Castro fought to eliminate this option. The state agreed to eliminate the possibility of the death penalty if he agreed to certain conditions. The condition was that he undergo a polygraph exam to determine if he was involved in any other crimes. Castro and his attorneys agreed to this. July 14th, Castro was back in court. A plea deal was submitted. The conditions, he would be put in prison for life without parole, with an additional thousand years of time served. Castro pleaded guilty to 937 counts. September 3rd, Ariel Castro hung himself with bed sheets in his prison cell, effectively ending his life. For his victims, he remains alive in spirit, as the human monster who haunts their dreams. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.